Well, good morning, church. How are we doing today? All right, good, good, good. If, if it's your first time here today, welcome home. That's something we like to say here because we love to feel like this place is home. And we love to make people who are brand new feel like they're at home. And if you are uh, joining us online, we know that a lot of times people like to check us out online first before they actually come and visit us. So to you, we hope to get to see you soon. Now, a lot of you in this building know who I am. A lot of you in this building know, especially the youth, know what my favorite movie is of all time. No, not Star Trek. I heard that. That's a sin. Who are you? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I do like Star Trek. I do like Star Trek. My, Star Wars. Thank you. Finally, yes. Okay, so as, as, I, was, as I was studying this in, in, this last, in this last installment of our series here, and I started thinking about misquoted, I did a little research. I did a little Googling. And I found out that one of the top three most misquoted movie lines of all times comes from my favorite movie of all time. And if you're a Star Wars nerd like I am, you know the best Star Wars movie of all time is Empire Strikes Back. Okay? It's the best. And, but one of the most misquoted lines, and out of about two dozen websites, this misquote is in the top three of all of them. And a lot of you, 90% of you who've seen the movie here today, know this quote. We all say it. Luke, I am your father. That's wrong. It's wrong. He doesn't say Luke. He says... Need some sound. What happened to your father? He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. He never says his name. But yet all of us misquote that line from that movie all the time. I do it in junior high night almost weekly. As soon as I grab the microphone to start the game, I'm like, Luke, I'm your father. And that's what I do to him. And I misquote it. And I'm a, one of, the, I mean, next to Ken Shaw, probably one of the biggest Star Wars geeks around. So, I mean, but it got me thinking about misquoting things and what can happen when we misquote things. Now, when you misquote something, sometimes you can give that, that thing or a person a bad rap or a bad rep, okay? You misquote something, you leave a word out, or it's like that, English, a lot of English teachers have this in that class where it says, I eat grandma and they, or, can't, or let's eat grandma and they miss the apostrophe or the comma and it looks like you literally want to eat grandma because you misquoted, you didn't use the apostrophe or the pause. But we can get a bad rap and even Christians do this. There's a verse in the Bible that we're going to look at today that gets a bad rap. Okay? And what it has to do with is this. This is a $10 bill. Sorry, that's all I had in my wallet. But this is a $10 bill. This gets a bad rap. Why? Because we misquote 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. When we quote that verse, we literally say, money is the root of all evil. But is that what the Bible says? Is money evil? I mean, at its best, it's, it's, it's an inanimate object. It doesn't really do anything. Doesn't, I mean, you can go to the store or the soda machine and get a soda or, you know, some food, but morally, at its best, it's neutral. It's neither good nor evil. So why do we misquote this? Why do we think money is evil? Well, somebody's to blame for this, and we're going to look at that today, because here's what the verse actually says. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have, war have, have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. So even when we quote it, we, we don't even say, we don't even say this part. All we say is, Money's the root of all evil. But Paul, in his letters to Timothy, says, no, money isn't evil. It's 
the love of money. Well, welcome to our fourth installment of our series, Misquoted. And this title of this sermon is called Bad Rap, because money gets a bad rap, as we just looked at. So let's take our Bibles, and if you will, open to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And there's a strange break between uh, verse 2 and 3. A sentence, the last sentence of verse 2 actually starts off the break in, in, in verse 3. So we're going to start there, and we're going to look at this verse, and we're going to look at the whole verse in context. In order to do that, and we've done that this whole series, we've taken the misquoted or misrepresented out of context verse, and we've read several verses either before or after or both to look at the context, to get the meaning of what the writer inspired by the Holy Spirit is going to say. So let's go ahead and start. And the first sentence, which would be I call 2B, as you can see right there, uh, let's start right there. Oh, and if you're following on your phones, that's fine too. If you click on that Uversion app, a little, a little, I'm going to give you guys a little hidden hack here we have here. If you have that U, Uversion app, on the bottom right, well, I have a droid, so at the bottom right, it says more. Click on that, and then find where it says events, click on that, and then find where it says the Church of Hope, First Baptist Church, click on that. And then you'll see everything that we're going to talk about right there in our sermon series. So let's get started in our verse. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in 2b. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels, about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and a constant friction between people of corrupt mind, who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world and we will take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, to kind of summarize, to kind of look at this in context, if we look through the first few verses, two through five, okay, Paul's warning Timothy, his young protege, against the warnings against false teachings. Now, what's going on here? Here's what's going on here. You have a group of people trying to infiltrate the church, okay, and they're called Pharisees. And what's happening is the Pharisees were the ones that used to keep the law. They would instruct you on the law, they would teach you the law, and then you would follow their lead. But then this guy, Jesus, comes around and turns it all upside down. And so what's happening here is you have this group of people who are causing problems by twisting and, and manipulating the gospel to fit something else. And so what Paul is trying to get Timothy to understand is these people, because of their wants to cause mischief, because he says it in the verse, these people are looking to cause, they're searching out controversies. They're looking for ways to twist and warp the gospel. And he even says that they are not even listening to the sound instructions of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that Christ taught the apostles that they passed on, that Paul is even passing on to Timothy, they won't even listen to. And it's caused something in their hearts. And at the end of verse 5, which is actually going to set up the context for verse 10, Paul states it. And he says at the end of verse 5, and he says, and these people believe that godliness is a means to financial gain. Now this causes a couple of problems here. Okay? And not just problems from 2,000 years ago. Because the same problems they had with this 2,000 years ago, we have today. 
One of those is, is they think, like he says, it, they, they believe it's a means to financial gain. Somebody, somewhere, sometimes, even in churches today, will be like, hey, you know, I gave, I gave a lot of money to the church. And they're looking for something. They're looking for respect. They're looking for even authority in the church. There's probably even been instances where money has bought elder seats. And this is what Paul is instructing Timothy to look out against. That's what these controversies, that's why these people are arguing and the doctrine and the gospel of Jesus Christ is being twisted because they're trying to work their way to something. Because Paul said it, they believe that godliness leads to a financial gain. And the other thing that this does is it almost leads you to believe that something that's huge today, and I'm sad to say, one of the main churches is in our lead pastor's home state. And there's a guy there that teaches something called a prosperity gospel. What is the prosperity gospel, you might ask? Well, here, let me tell you. If you have enough faith, if you believe in God enough, if you just put all your hope and trust in him, it sounds kind of good, doesn't it? But if you believe enough and have enough faith, pardon, pardon the imitation of him, but you will have that Mercedes in your garage. It's not what's going on here. It's not what money's about. Remember, like I said, this is at best is an inanimate object. It, it's nothing. It only means something when it's used for good or evil. What does that mean? What makes money evil? I do. You do. Money is either good or evil depending on how we use it. That's what Paul is instructing Timothy here. This is what he's trying to get Timothy to understand so he can instruct the church. Now you gotta understand where Timothy is. Timothy is in Ephesus. Ephesus is a, an extremely rich city. Extremely rich. And so Timothy has to battle this. It is why Paul took this chapter and, told, and started talking to Timothy about money. Because he's dealing with these types of people. The people who want to try to buy their way into the church. The people who are thinking that if they have enough faith and have enough belief, God will give them even more money. But what is great gain? What does the Bible say is great gain? Well, here's what Paul says in verses 6 through 8. This is going to be a little hard pill to swallow. In verses 6 through 8, he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, godly with contentment is great gain. Then Paul goes on to say, You came into the world with nothing. You will leave this world with nothing. I love the way Job said it. Job said it like this. Naked I come into the world, naked I go out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Everything we have from birth to death belongs to God. Watch this. Uh, whoops. Oh, there it is. Sorry about that. David, at the end of his life, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 14 through probably 16. David is at the end of his life. David wants to build the temple to honor God. God says no. God says there's blood on your hands. You're not going to do it. Your son Solomon's going to do it. So David's got to be content with that. And David is a man after God's own heart. And David understands he has to be content with this. Because look at what he says. Starting in verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give so generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Our days on the earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord our God, all this abundance we have provided for building your temple for your holy name, 
comes from your hand. It belongs to God. What Paul is telling Timothy here is basically this. I'll break it into terms even a junior higher can understand. Everything you amass from birth to death is not even yours. It is a blessing from God. It is something he has blessed you with. Your ability to take in the very air he spoke into, in, in, into existence is his. The sun that shines through the window is his. My house that sits on Bedford Drive is his. The cars are his. This is his. It's a blessing from him. He knows what you need and he provides it. Verses 9 and 10 talk about the perils of loving money over loving God. This is where we get to the nitty gritty. Because there are, there are bad things. He described it. Paul described it. He says people were into controversies. And what caused that, what came out of that was envy, strife, malicious talk or trash talk about somebody else. All these bad things came out of it. And then Paul said, because of this, and because they thought that godliness led to financial gain, he goes, for the love of money is the root of all evil. So in order to understand what he's saying there, you have to take that word love, and now I'm going to Bible nerd on you, and you have to find out what that word love means in the Greek. And I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it because it starts with a P and it's about this long because this one word means a phrase. Yes, they translated it out for the love of money, but it means this, an extreme greed for material wealth. Paul's just not talking about money here. He's talking about possessions also. He's talking about idolatry. Idolatry, simply put, is anything that stands between you and your relationship with God. Anything that blocks you and your relationship with God is idolatry. It's so important that it's the first of the Ten Commandments, I believe. You shall have no other gods before me. And he's not just talking about Zeus, Apollo, Baal, or any of those. He's talking about all kinds of things. This is one of them. And this is what Paul's talking about today. If you love this more than God, it's going to lead you to a fork in the road and you are going to have to make a decision. Do I love God or do I love money? Because Jesus said it best, you can't love both. Actually, he said you can't serve both. And you can't love, how, how was I going to say that? You can't serve without loving it. If you love money, you're going to serve money. Your end goal in life is going to be to try to amass so much wealth and material things, and out of that you think you're going to have power, but you're not, because the Bible says you're not even going to take it with you. Okay, big shock to the pharaohs who were buried with all their wealth. They didn't get to use it. You're not going to get to use it. But God makes a promise. He says, if you love me, if you serve me, if you study my word, if you do all these, if you, and I'm not saying this as a way to gain your salvations. I'm not talking about that. But he says, if you love me more than money, treasures you will store up in heaven. I took a couple of verses there and mashed them together. You know, I'm kind of, freelancing a little bit, but you get the meaning of it. You can't love money and love God. It leads down a path of ruin. And for those of you who are my age and a little older, let me tell you something. Led Zeppelin and ACDC got it right. Because Led Zeppelin said there was a stairway to heaven. The stairway, what's a stairway? It's narrow, right? Jesus even said it. The road to eternal life is narrow. But ACDC got it right when they said, it's a highway to hell. It's an eight-lane, eight two-way 
one or eight lane one way I-5 from Northern California to South. <laughs> Boom. But the pathway to heaven was narrow. But the trick is a heart issue. The trick is, is where's your heart? What are you focused on? If your heart and your mind are focused on Christ, something happens. This is what happens. When your heart and mind is focused on Christ and he is the center of your life, godliness with contentment comes when Christ is the center of your life. That's the fill in the blanks in your notes. Godliness with contentment comes when Christ is the center of your life. The writer of Hebrews, who I tend to camp out as being the Apostle Paul, it's not really known who is, but I tend to think it was Paul because a lot of his writings and his letters are similar to what's going on in Hebrews. Look, Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Sound familiar? And content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you never will I forsake you. He's saying the same thing here in Hebrews 13, 5, as he said to Tim Timothy in chapter 6, except now he summarizes 2 through 10 in one statement and then adds a promise. Godliness and contentment come when Christ is in the center of your life. When your heart and your mind is focused on the cross, the outflowing of that is huge not to do not to sound like a really bad donald trump impression but it's massive when your heart and your mind is focused on christ and he is the center of your universe you get godliness with contentment that's why when paul and joe talked about it when he and joel talked about it in philippians chapter 4 when the apostle paul said i am content whether i have a lot or I have nothing. As a matter of fact, he says, I have learned to live that way. Whether I have everything or nothing, I have learned to be content. On the everything side, if you have money and your desire is to amass more and it becomes the most important thing in your life and you lose sight of Christ and you lose sight of your family, Relationships are going to struggle. Paul said it. He talked about it with those people at the beginning, right around verse 2 or 3. He said it's going to start all kinds of controversies, and there's going to be all kinds of arguments, and people are just going to fight because they're not focused on Christ. I like to say this. Any relationship that you have will tend to struggle if Jesus is not in the center of it. Let me say that again. Any relationship you have will tend to struggle if Christ is not in the center of it. Godliness with contentment comes when Jesus is in the center of your life. But he promises he'll never leave you or forsake you. Show me anybody else that will make that promise to you. He is always there. Good times, bad, in want, or need for nothing. He is there. And if he is, is, is in the center of your life, you have figured out godliness with contentment. As a matter of fact, this even lets us know what to do. Did you guys know that? Your money will tell you what to do. Watch this. You see it? What's it say right here above the building? Let's say it all together. One, two, three. Money's figured it out. And it's an inanimate object. It can't even think for itself. I tend to believe that somebody, when they switched 
from buying and selling and trading with gold and silver and they decided to make paper money, somebody knew this was going to happen. And so they decided to stamp it. And it's, and it's on everything. It's on the penny, the nickel, the dime, the quarter, the 50 cent piece, the dollar, the one dollar, the five dollar, the twenty dollar, the hundred dollar. It's on every one of our pieces of currency. In God we trust. If money can figure it out, we can figure it out. Because godliness and contentment come when Christ is in the center of our life. And I got a few tricks for you. Some more life hacks. Is the terminology today. Four things. Godliness and contentment comes when Christ is in the center of your life. Number one. Be in the Word. Read the Word of God. We say it all the time here. Get into the Word because this stuff gets into you. Amen. That's right. And if you're doing number one, number two will happen. You're living out the Word. You're walking it out. It's called the sanctification process. You're living it out. You're being a light. Okay? And then if you're doing that, Number three happens. You are serving in love. What's the definition of love? A random, a random act of kindness on someone else's behalf. It's biblical. It's right there. And if all those three things are happening, number four should be fairly easy. And that's be in fellowship. Being in fellowship means being around people who have the same mind as you, who think the same things, who believe the same things in you. And if you are doing that, you are being encouraged to do one, two, and three. They all go, they all go hand in hand. They all go together. One affects the other. So remember, oh, I forgot to tell you this. Notice, I did not repeat any of the verses next to these points. Here's why. You have a little homework. If I'm going to be a teacher, I'm going to act like one. In your notes should be these four points written down towards the bottom somewhere. If they're not there, write them down. See, so you hear the authority in my voice? Write them down. No, I'm kidding. But write them down and then write the verses next to them. And then I want you to take these verses and go home and read the point and the verse, and then let it, what I, and I love to use barbecue terminology, let it marinate in your heart. Think about it. Process it. Let it saturate it. Read it over again. Think about it for a week. Move on to the next one. Do one every 15 minutes. I don't care how you do it. Just do it. And watch what happens. Watch what happens in here. Because in here is where it starts. When this gets wired to, cro to the cross and this gets wired to this, all this can happen. All this happens. And you get godliness with contentment comes when Christ is at the center of your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity to be able to walk into this building that you have provided, Lord, and that you have blessed us with to be, and to be able to walk in it and to worship you, to figure out that you, Father, are the center of our lives, that even the very breath that we take, you created, and that nothing has come into existence except through you and for you. And so, Father, I just pray that God, that you just become the center of our hearts, Lord. And if, and if there's anybody here who's never heard of you, who may be seeking to see who you are, God, that they found you. That you can be the center of their universe too. That you can be at the pinnacle of their life. That you can be the hope that they've been looking for. And so, Father, we lift up the rest of this day to you and we ask in Jesus' name, amen.